lucky to have Pepe Rossi here, Rossi, Rossi here tonight to talk with us about Puerto Rico, and he's just back from Vaquez. Vaquez. Okay. I should have not said it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Go. So thank you all for being here. I was thinking as I uh, was getting ready to, to, to speak about Vieques, um, when we started organizing for Cuba in the capital region, I went, uh, I wrote to some of the progressive elders in the capital region. And I was meeting, I don't know if it was David Easter or Larry Winder, and uh, we were in a, at a coffee house somewhere, and, we, and I really wanted to pick his brain uh, about uh, how to organize for Cuba and who might be allies and so on. And, and I said something to uh, Larry or David, Oops. Um, something like, you know, even if I was not Latino, I would still be organizing for Cuba because I think that Cuba, I realize we're here for Vietnam. But um, I said something like, even if I was not Latino, I'd be organizing for Cuba, because I think Cuba holds a very important uh, role in letting us progressives know about what is possible. And then I caught myself about what I just said. I said, you know, Larry, that's a, that's a lot of BS. I feel very emotionally uh, tied to Cuba, the Cuban Revolution. Uh, we grew up reciting a poem, Cuba and Puerto Rico are the two wings of the same bird. So if I can't be claimed to be um, emotionally um, neutral about Cuba, I can much less claim to be neutral about Puerto Rico and much less about Vieques. Vieques is a place uh, very dear to my heart. Um, I first met Vieques when I was 16 years old. I had just finished high school. I was on my way to the University of Puerto Rico as a freshman. And during that summer in July, Cuba, uh, Vieques has a carnival, a wonderful celebration every year. And, and I went with two of my, all my buddies. Um, Vieques population at least triples or quadruples for carnival. And of course, it, you know, we have no reservations, nor money about to have a place to stay. And the first night we stayed in the Vieques uh, fireman station. And uh, the next night, uh, one of my buddies met some girls, and again, you know, 15, 16 year olds, and um, they lived with the family, of course, and we stayed with the family. It was a very um, humble family. They were, uh, it was a poor family. And, uh, and they took us in for, uh, we were there like three or four days, they took us in, and it, it was, Vieques became for me, like, like I grew up hearing that Puerto Rico was. I grew up hearing that Puerto Rico and, and Puerto Ricans are very hospitalarian, it's a very friendly place, but I grew up in San Juan, and that's not true of San Juan. Um, what, my, what I tell my friends when they ask me about where to go in Puerto Rico, I say the rule of thumb is the further away you get from San Juan, the prettier it gets, the cheaper it gets, the friendlier it gets, and I said prettier again. And that is absolutely, yes, yeah, it's about as far as you can get from Puerto Rico. Uh, perhaps Mona Island on the other coast, on our west, may be further away, but Mona is uninhabited. Vieques has roughly 9,000 people, 93,000, 9,300 uh, residents. <clears throat> what I learned about Vieques in that first day was in the middle of the summer, they do what we in the, all of Puerto Rico do in Christmas. We have these rolling parties, we call them asaltos, they're nothing like assaults. But they are kind of surprise parties. We show up at your house, and you have to bring the food and the booze and feed us. And then after your food is up, then we go to your house. And we have our instruments, and we're singing. And, and we do that typically in all Puerto Rico Christmas. And I think it's only Vieques that does this at least a couple, time, a couple more times a year. Vieques was, for me, a, a, a really a discovery. I was not politically involved back then. I just finished high school in a um, very Catholic uh, family at a very Catholic school. Um, and I was about to have an awakening as I entered the University of Puerto Rico, but that had not happened yet. So my first attachment to Vieques was about, this is a gorgeous place, 
some of the most beautiful beaches in the Caribbean. You may have seen uh, the Travel Channel or uh, uh, Condé Nast Traveler, and they always rank uh, uh, some of the beaches in Vieques, some of the, the top ten in the world. And that is true. I just looked it up. Uh, both Condé Nast Traveler and the Travel Channel say that uh, uh, red, what, what the gringos call Red Beach, what we call Porcho, uh, is among the, the ten most beautiful beaches. Well, when you go to Vieques, it's hard to say. Uh, uh, we, we were just there a few days ago, and we went to some of these amazing beaches, and it's hard to say that this one is prettier than the other. These are uh, the, the you know, legendary white sand beach with crystal clear turquoise water. Uh, really, really amazing beauty. And, uh, and I'll tell you more about the beauty of Vieques. At the University of Puerto Rico, I became politically involved. It was uh, I became involved with Cuba, I became involved in the independence of Puerto Rico. And at that time, one of the causes that we that supported independence of Puerto Rico were most active was, uh, with was about to end the Navy bombing that at the time was happening mostly in Culebra, Vieques Sister Island. Uh, Culebra is, uh, Vieques is six miles from Puerto Rico, Culebra is about eight. Uh, Culebra is a little bit smaller than Vieques, but back then, uh, most of the Navy bombing, uh, this is 1967, was concentrated on Flamenco Beach in, uh, in Culebra. Flamenco is also among the top 10 prettiest beaches in the world. I brag, but it happens to be true. Uh, and I'm proud of it. <clears throat> but this amazing beach was being bombed from as far as the Dominican Republic, uh, from ships, from some of the fastest planes. It was, they were using it for amphibious invasions. And when you go today to this gorgeous beach, this Flamenco Beach in Culebra, there is an old tank full of holes opened by missiles and, and other weapons that have hit that tank on the end of, of Flamenco. And sadly, it was about six years ago, a girl from, uh, a 14 year old girl from, uh, from New Jersey, was injured by an unexploded ordnance on that amazing beach. Uh, the bombing in Culebra ended in 1980, I believe it was, after uh, the Navy almost uh, killed uh, six children that were swimming on Flamenco Beach. And uh, there was, the protest became a lot louder, and, uh, um, and, and the United States ended the bombing of Culebra. And then they redoubled the bombing of Vieques. It's not as if they had not been bombing Vieques. <coughs> but I'm getting ahead of the story. I'm getting ahead of the story because I'd like you to know that I was very much a part of the, of the movement to end the bombing of Culebra back then. And, and we would invade beaches. Uh, we, call, we call them invasion. Uh, we call them liberation. Uh, you know, to, to interrupt the bombing. Uh, we'd sit, a bunch of us would sit on the beach while there was a bombing. and. Uh, they would come and take us out, and uh, uh, you know it was a cat and mouse game a lot of uh, a lot of that time. Uh, again, then I migrated to the United States in '73, and uh, became uh, remain involved in, in the movement to uh, end colonialism in Puerto Rico uh, and to end the bombing in Vieques. Um, I've gone to Vieques since then dozens of times. I just spent uh, a wonderful weekend in Vieques. Uh, met with uh, many, many activists in Vieques, activists for uh, environment, people that have been working uh, their whole life in defense of Vieques. And I'll speak to you more in a little bit about some of the initiatives that we're, we here in the capital region are working to support the people of Vieques. So, but I'm here to talk about the effect of the hurricanes. People think of oh, Hurricane Maria there were the hurricanes. There were Irma first, and except, uh, I think it's uh, August 6th. And then exactly uh, 14 days later, two weeks later, came Maria, the most devastating hurricane in Puerto Rico's history. Uh, Puerto Rico had not seen a Category 5 hurricane since 1928, uh, San Silviano. Um, and Vieques saw two Category 5 hurricanes within two weeks. And that's part of what I'll talk about today. So 
many of us have an idea of where uh, Vieques is. You see Florida, the greater Antilles. Puerto Rico is the, less, the, the smaller of the uh, greater Antilles. But as you can see, it's the easternmost of the greater Antilles. And so it has an important <coughs> military strategic location in the Caribbean, the Anagada Channel in the in Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, and the Mono Channel in Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, are key, key um, uh, locations for, uh, for to control, uh, to control the uh, Central America in particular, to control the Caribbean. Uh, and this is true during the Spanish colonialism, which is why uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico became uh, perhaps the most heavily fortified um, city in the New World. You go today to San Juan, there are these amazing walls, uh, 30, 40 feet, 30 or 40 feet thick walls uh, all around the city. And that's because um, Spain would take the wealth of, uh, of Latin America, uh, particularly the uh, gold of Peru, the silver of Mexico, and they would pile it up in Puerto Rico they had, until they had a large you know, armada to protect uh, that wealth on its way to uh, Spain. And it's precisely that, that Admiral Dewey, uh, an important military um, uh, figure in early 20th, uh, actually late 19th and early 20th century uh, American history, uh, identified several places that the United States should take, take. And certainly, uh, Puerto Rico was one, Cuba was another, and the Philippines another. No accident that that's exactly what happened in the Spanish-American War. So that's a little bit about the geopolitics of Vieques. Um, that's a map of Puerto Rico, and you can see Vieques Island. Puerto Rico is roughly 100 miles uh, wide by 35 miles, uh, 100 miles long by 35 miles wide. Uh, Vieques is about 26 miles long by uh, six miles wide, um, and I forget the size of Culebra, you can see Sister Island Culebra, just a little bit further to the northeast. Uh, they call these uh, the, the, um, the, American, the, the, the Spanish Virgin Islands, uh, because geographically they're very similar. If you've been to uh, St. Thomas, St. Croix, St. John, you've seen very similar uh, dynamics, uh, geography, uh, to that which we see in Vieques. This is the path of Irma, but like I said, it, it happened exactly two weeks before Puerto Rico. And what I'd like you to notice uh, is how close in part, the, 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 the only part of Puerto Rico that got, that experienced Irma is a Category 5 hurricane were Vieques and Culebra Islands. Uh, fortunately for Puerto Rico, for the main island, um, uh, Hurricane Irma deviated north after it hit the uh, Culebra and Vieques and it spared much of Puerto Rico. It didn't fully spare it. We, these were not only some of the most powerful hurricanes that we've seen, um, uh, call it climate change, if we can. Um, they were also huge. Uh, I think I have a map of the size of these islands uh, that I'll show you in a few minutes, but you'll see that when, uh, when Irma was and Maria were hitting Vieques, uh, as a category five. There were category three winds already hitting our westernmost uh, towns, westernmost municipalities. And this is, again, when people don't talk much about Irma, uh, certainly it, it was very devastated in Cuba. And there's some lessons there about how Cuba went about to uh, recover from Hurricanes Harvey and Irma. Uh, we have some friends in our uh, uh, Cuba group that were in uh, Cuba uh, two weeks after Hurricane Irma uh, hit Cuba, and, and they, they commented on how uh, electricity was back in practically all of Cuba. 94% of Cuba uh, had electricity two weeks after Hurricane uh, Irma. Today, four months after Hurricane uh, Irma, uh, about 40% of Puerto Ricans still lack electricity and reliable water. So this is uh, Irma, uh, this is Irma and Vieques. Um, and, and this is strange, I guess um, <coughs> when, when you grow up in the tropics and, and you migrate as I, as I did to the, uh, to the United States, when we see the trees in, in the state that we see them now in the winter, 
For us, a tree is dead. We don't have an autumn where the leaves fall. And so when you see something like this, and I have a picture later on of uh, a Junca, or one of our rainforests, um, uh, where, where it's totally barren, uh, no bushes, uh, the, the trees that are, that are still up have no leaves. And that, that's weird. That's, uh, that's something we've never seen. I should say that I, I, I grew up in Puerto Rico. I didn't migrate to the States until I was 23. And frankly, uh, I guess this will sound alienated, but it's alienated, a six, seven year old, year old child. Uh, hurricanes were fun. Hurricanes meant we wouldn't have to go to school for two or three days. Hurricanes meant that our family piled up on crackers and chocolate. And I spent uh, hurricanes, and uh, our back room was the sturdiest part of the house. Uh, because both my parents had had uh, roofs uh, blown up by uh, hurricanes in their childhood. I never knew in my childhood hurricanes quite like uh, San Ciprian, San Felipe, the legendary uh, uh, hurricanes that, that, that still don't compare to uh, Irma and Maria. Uh, <coughs> but but we'd spend, uh, spend the hurricanes playing parchisi with my sister, playing board games with my sister, and hurricanes, uh, the idea we had about hurricanes was different or at least of a, a lower middle class child growing up in a cement home as we did. Because later on as, a, as, a, as, a, as an activist at the University of Puerto Rico, I came to know about what happens to the other half or the other 90% uh, uh, when there's a hurricane in Puerto Rico. And I'll talk some more about that when I'll, I'll share a picture with you. So this is uh, in Vieques, uh, Hurricane Irma. And it really devastated uh, much of Vieques. Uh, it really uh, caused widespread damage in Puerto Rico also. But the damage that uh, Irma caused in Puerto Rico does not compare at all with the damage that, that it caused in, uh, uh, in Vieques. Uh, so for instance, my, uh, my sister-in-law, uh, I just stayed w with her. My sister-in-law had not had uh, electricity since uh, Irma since Hurricane Irma, uh, and they just got it back on December. Uh, so, so Irma was no, um, no Mickey Mouse uh, hurricane. Irma was a devastating hurricane, but in comparison with Maria, it, it was. Uh, this is now Maria, the path of Maria, and as you can see, uh, it, it again hit uh, Vietes and Culebra Islands, uh, with Category 5 winds. By the time that it got to our main island in Puerto Rico, it was Category 4. So Puerto Rico, uh, our main island, was spared of, of Category 5. So it still hasn't had a Category 5 hurricane since 1928. Uh, but this is a, a huge hurricane. Here you can see how um, both um, the British Virgin Islands and westernmost Puerto Rico have what are Category 2 or 3 hurricane winds at the same time. That's how large this is. A, uh, that's a distance of probably about 600 miles. Uh, it, it's a monstrous uh, hurricane. Um, uh, I'll show you some pictures. I'm going to do this quickly because I, I one of the bad things about waiting till the last minute when you have so much material is I way too many slides. So I'm going to go quickly over these because we've seen them on TV. We've seen pictures of this. And I'd like to spend some more time talking about what, what it is that we're doing. So I'm going to, what I'd like to show with these pictures is how widespread the damage of Maria was in Puerto Rico. That from uh, Fajardo in the east to uh, in, the, in the northeast to Cabo Rojo in the southwest, that there was very widespread devastation throughout all of Puerto Rico. Uh, so this is Canovana in the northeast. This is uh, Barrio Vietnam in Guaynabo, uh, one of the uh, suburbs of San Juan. Uh, this is Comerillo in uh, central eastern part of the island. Uh, and that was one month after. And this is uh, uh, what, what is so odd for us to see. It, it is it's just something, frankly, I've never seen it. And, and uh, I'll tell you, I've never seen it because I. Uh, by the time I go to Puerto Rico, it was December, and it's a trouble. Nature had come back. On, on my second day, I, I got there something like the 19th of December, 
And my second day in Puerto, my first full day in Puerto Rico, my sister took me, uh, she, she helps out at a, uh, an animal rescue place on our uh, southeast. And, uh, and we went along the north coast of Puerto Rico and then down the eastern coast to the southeastern corner of Puerto Rico. And I was amazed because I had seen these pictures and nature was back. There was greenery all over, all the bushes, you could still see palm trees, you, just, you would still see many topo trees, but the trees that were standing were coming back. That night, I, I was walking in Old San Juan, and somebody had put up a, uh, a poster board uh, with a, an essay. It's just like two or three paragraphs, uh, no, no name. And it was a very, uh, uh, it really struck me uh, by what I saw. It said something like, it said it much better than I can ever say it. I wish I had taken a picture of it and, and I could share it with you. Of course, it, it, it was in Spanish. But it says something like, Hurricanes uh, Irma and Maria showed us a part of Puerto Rico that many of us did not know or had forgotten was there. As it took away the leaves, as it took away the brushes, as it took away the vegetation, we saw the shacks. We saw how so many of our people live. And it reminded us of privilege, and it reminded us of lack of privilege. <laughs> Let's hope, he said, uh, or she said, whoever wrote it, Let's hope that we don't forget about that other side of Puerto Rico. And it was. In 1971, um, I, was a, uh, I was in the student government. I was in a, 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 in a leadership position, the student government in, in the, the, against the Vietnam War. Um, and there was a terrible, it wasn't even a, uh, a hurricane. It was a, uh, a tropical depression. Uh, but it was a tropical depression that remained stationary over Puerto Rico. And it caused widespread devastation because it rained and rained and rained for days. It just would not move. And, and so there were many deaths. It was one of the most devastating uh, natural uh, uh, events that we had had uh, over until then, 1971. Um, and there was widespread flood lots all over. And we organized brigades of students to go to different areas uh, to help out. First in rescue, uh, getting people out of uh, other, uh, other houses, uh, often in boats, uh, take them to some rescue, uh, some, some refuge places. And I had an experience that for me growing up middle class, I, 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 it, it was a very important experience. I uh, was coordinating help in an area of Catano. Catano is a town that is across San Juan Bay. And um, much of Catano is filled, um, what's the word in English? Uh, the, the water is partly uh, wet part of the year? What's a wetland. So, so much of Catano is uh, filled up wetland. And so in this area where I was assigned to uh, to coordinate uh, rescue and, uh, and assistance of operations. Um, it, it was uh, one of those wetlands, and many of the homes were built on stilts. Many of the homes were shacks. And, um, and we're organizing getting, uh, 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 getting supplies to give to people, uh, sending people to, uh, to rescue in a zone that we had learned. Uh, you know, we, we had uh, radio, uh, radio telephones that uh, sent information about where the help was needed. And they came to get me because uh, somebody said there's this old lady in this hut that doesn't want to leave. And, and the water is already uh, about uh, four inches in her home. The water, her home was on stilts. So they asked me if I could go there try to uh, persuade her to come with us. So we had to go on a boat because there were about 20 feet of water there. And effectively, her home was on stilts. Uh, her home was a one-room shack made with reclaimed wood, thrown away wood. Actually, one whole side, it was a one-room shack, one whole side of her, um, of her house was one of those huge traffic signs that we see here, typically green. It says Schenectady this way. They're pretty big. If you see them up close, they're pretty big. That was one wall of her home. 
uh, another wall had a window uh, with some rocks outside, which was her stove. Uh, no running water. She had some uh, cardboard, uh, some wood boxes, wood crates, and, and some uh, sacks, and that was her bed. She had a little table and two chairs and two chickens that she had brought in, but she didn't want to lose them. Because as we, as we went on the boat, we would see drowned dogs, you see drowned pigs, you see uh, drowned rats, you see uh, uh, floating outhouses and floating huts. Um, I, I, I was there, and, and it really impacted me, that experience with this woman. Uh, I spent about 20 minutes trying to persuade her to leave, and she would not leave. I said, I can't leave. I, I, uh, my daughter is, uh, has not returned, and I'm afraid that she'll come back she won't find me. And besides, I don't want to lose everything I have. Um, and that really tore my, my soul at the time. I could not persuade her, and we went and got the police, and the police actually took her out by force. Um, I was actually able to see her later, because I, I did get, I, I promised that I would be in touch uh, with her if I found her daughter, and I, I, I knew the refuge that she had been taken. Her daughter was in another refuge. But that stayed with me because every time that I hear of a hurricane in Puerto Rico, I remember them. I don't remember kids like me playing in that uh, cement room, uh, parchisi, and, and drinking chocolate and having crackers uh, in a hurricane. I think of Doña Andrea was her name. I think of Doña Andrea in that room. And that is uh, what that essay in, that I saw that night in Old San Juan reminded me of. Let's not forget about what's behind that vegetation. Uh, let's not forget about that other part of Puerto Rico. Uh, those of us, particularly those of us that live in San Juan, that grew up in metropolitan San Juan, are less used to seeing. So th this is actually, I, I use this one because this is right near uh, that area um, uh, where, I, where I did coordinate the rescue, where I met Doña Andrea. Um, now, this is uh, now Nuri Maria, and uh, the houses are in much, much better shape than they had. Actually, many of the people that were there were, after the hurricanes, because they lost so much, they were forced, forced to, uh, uh, really forced to move out to some uh, public housing development that is, is now called Guanamatos. But they, they built all their homes. Again, these are much, much better than any of the homes that we were seeing back then. Uh, but it is very close to that area that brought so much memory. This is a Utuado, uh, almost uh, dead center, Puerto Rico, uh, uh, west of center. Uh, so there was a, a uh, uh, there, there was a, and I just skipped a couple, maybe that's okay because uh, there's so many of these. Um, a down, uh, uh, down the bridge, which is what we have seen on, on TV here, about communities that were left isolated, communities that uh, that there was no way to get there by land. Uh, they uh, could only bring supplies in uh, through helicopters or through uh, uh, improvised uh, uh, ropes and, and uh, you know, pulleys and, and, and systems. And this was the life of many people in Puerto Rico, bathing in Utuado, which is how some people died of leptospirosis, uh, uh, a, uh, a communicable disease. Uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, a problem on the tropics, where we see people bathing, washing clothes, and uh, in in a stream, uh, they put some uh, pipe, a PVC pipe, as well. People could actually uh, bathe uh, because they uh, they don't have. And this is what uh, the caption says: 45 days after Maria. <coughs> um, the other the other part, I actually want you to see this. <coughs> This is where there was a down uh, bridge. Actually, this is in Morobi, it's not in Mutuado. Uh, there were many bridges that fell. This is Chorens Torres, is a public housing development in uh, Metropolitan San Juan, close to Isla Verde. Um, but this is the other story about what happened after the hurricanes. Uh, a, a long line to buy ice in Arecibo, as long as there was ice. Uh, sometimes my, uh, my family would tell me the experience of waiting on a line for hours and uh, on a line for gasoline for hours and then to be told that, sorry, we run out of gas. And that also happened to many people with. 
uh, with eyes. Uh, you see, um, these people, it's 2.30 a.m. This is Ponce, our second largest city. Uh, it's 2.30 a.m. This ice store would not open till 7, but people are already lining up uh, to try to get some ice because there was such scarcity. Um, this is a line for gas in Corozal, in uh, uh, east of uh, central Puerto Rico. Uh, and this is uh, the belongings of people fighting over to Abaja. When I asked my family, what can I send, one of the things that they asked for were insect repellents, uh, rat traps, or rat uh, ways of controlling the mice, because there was so much vegetation, there was so much trash that was piling up, that piled up for months, uh, that the population of mosquitoes in Puerto Rico increased terribly, <coughs> as did the population of rats and other, um, and other vermin. Uh, this is about I, uh, Vieques, and I'd like to share a few, uh, a few slides, and again, I'll do this quickly because I have quite a few, about the beauty of Vieques. Um, so again, that's Vieques, just east of Puerto Rico, uh, six miles. Um, uh, this is actually a uh, sun bay on the top, uh, a, a public, actually all beaches in Puerto Rico are public. We have balnearios that have facilities, like showers and so on. This is the only balneario in Vieques, but it is gorgeous. Uh, uh, and right next to, uh, uh, to Sun Bay, there's uh, Navio and uh, Moon Bay that are even prettier, uh, smaller beaches. And then you go um, just east of that and you find, I'll tell you about that in a minute, about the Bioluminescent Bay. This is uh, uh, Bahia Chiba. Uh, it, it is one of the beaches that was uh, rescued from the Navy and uh, we managed to uh, evict the Navy from uh, Puerto Rico and we, we cut back some of the land. And now we find that there was some gorgeous beaches that we didn't know about. In uh, this one, in Camp, the former Camp Garcia, this is another, this is Playa, uh, they used to call them, they, they were not very imaginative in the Navy, they were Green Beach, Blue Beach, Red Beach. Uh, uh, I think this is Playa Colorado. Uh, uh, this is by Yala Chiva. I think this is my favorite, uh, uh, my favorite recording in Vieques. It's not very, you go there on any, any given day that's not a summer day, and you may very well have one of the prettiest beaches on earth all to yourself, as I have. Um, again, they're just amazing. This is Punta Arenas on the uh, westernmost point in uh, Vieques, where they, uh, I'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. Well, I'll tell you that about now. Um, this is a map of Vieques. In 1941, the Navy expropriated uh, two-thirds of the island of Vieques. They built a, um, a, a place for target practice on the eastern end of Vieques, uh, and uh, land to practice their um, amphibious invasions. And then on the other end of the island, they put a huge munitions depot and to buffer between the bombing and the munitions, they put the people of the <laughs> Vietnam. This is uh, Esperanza uh, that was terribly devastated. Vietnam is, uh, is a hilly uh, land. Uh, and uh, this is Esperanza. It didn't quite look like that when I was there. They've done a lot to rebuild. Uh, Vietnam is an amazing place. They have a real sense of community. Um, and there are wild horses in Vieques all over. These are really wild horses, uh, living, growing, multiplying in our beaches, multiplying everywhere. Um, and this is what makes Vieques unique. A bioluminescent bay, it is really one of the most amazing uh, feats of nature. This is uh, dinoflagellates, this bacteria that grows in, the, uh, uh, in this bay. And it goes in many other places. But this bay is particularly shallow and it has a particularly narrow entrance that is convoluted so that the, it allows for the concentration uh, of these, uh, these amazing bacteria that makes, makes it glow at night. Um, it's, it's, a, it's amazingly beautiful. You see, actually I have a, this actually is a fish that's moving in the water. Uh, as the boat as a, as a boat approaches, you see the fish in the boat, and it's like lightning bolts on the water. The first time my son uh, jumped in, we had actually seen, we have another bioluminescent bay in La Parguera, in our south, 
western corner of Puerto Rico, which is not as bright as it is. Vieques is actually <coughs> the brightest bioluminescent bay in the world. Uh, it's called Mosquito Bay. Um, it's a long story. It's not because of the, mosqu not because of the mosquitoes. Um, <coughs> the first time my son jumped in, in the water there, he, he was about six years old, and he jumps in, and it's like a thousand fluorescent bulbs light up, and he would not stop giggling. Uh, he, you know, if you take a little bit of the water in hand, he says, look at that, stars. It is amazing. It, it is, it is, it's an amazingly beautiful uh, thing. Uh, somebody doing angels instead of in the snow. Um, but it, it really is a fabulous uh, experience, uh, somebody just having a few bucketfuls of water. Uh, this is so beautiful that my son, that first night, he was stung by jellyfish. And fortunately, it was not uh, one of the, the worst jellyfish. It was actually, as the jellyfish go, we were both stung. Uh, it was a mild jellyfish. And he insisted on going back and jumping in the next day. That's how, uh, how much he loved his experience. And that's a bacteria, uh, dino, dinoflagellates. This is actually an aerial view of the bay, of Mosquito Bay. As you can see, it's a, it's a uh, narrow entrance that, does, that allows, again, the concentration that makes this the brightest bioluminescent bay in the world. And this is the area that the Navy had been bombing, had been creating such havoc. Havoc that you'll see as uh, consequences to today. Well, the, uh, it's these um, mangroves, particularly this is a red mangrove, that is what most uh, uh, helps support the dinoflagellates, the concentration of dinoflagellates. One of the great things about Vieques is they're doing amazing uh, uh, environmental conservation work, and, and she is a volunteer for a great group, uh, Fide Comiso. Uh, I met with the, uh, the deputy director of Fide Comiso. Fide Comiso is a, a trust, a conservation trust, and they are now uh, trying to extend the population of the red, uh, of the red mangroves uh, to enhance. This is Mosquito Bay. It doesn't, a day, during the day, it looks like just any mangrove. But it, it, is, it is what makes Vieques unique. Uh, so as I said, it happened in 1941. This is a 1940 map of Vieques. Each dot, of, each dot represents 20 residents. The population then was about 11,000 people. As you can see, it's, it's, it's uh, not evenly distributed. It was mostly on the western end of Vieques. And certainly in Isabel II, as the, no, the Vieques main town, Sorry about that. <laughs> so this is a 1940 map. It was 1941 when when the Navy uh, confiscated all the land on, on two thirds of Vieques. Um, there were actually five sugar mills in Vieques in uh, the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, after this um, land steal, um, there were no um, there were no um, uh, sugar mills, and there was no more commercial growing of sugar in Vieques. Uh, many Viequenses uh, had to relocate. Uh, St. Croix has a very large population, something like 25% uh, of the population of St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands are Puerto Ricans, and certainly a lot of people in, in, in our main island uh, had relocated from Vieques. Um, and it, it, has, it continues to this day to hamper the, uh, the growth and development of, of Vieques. Uh, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of, of myself. This again is the population, I think I maybe I, want, I put this one twice. And so again, this map, we've seen it already. We see the, uh, uh, the, the munitions depot on the west, the, uh, the bombing site on the east and the uh, residents in the middle. And, and this is some of the weapons. It's some of the most advanced weapons of the Pentagon have been tested, were tested in Vieques in 1941 and 2003 when we finally managed to get uh, the Pentagon to stop uh, bombing Vieques. It wasn't just the Pentagon. They would literally rent Vieques out to their NATO allies so they could practice their bombing. So there would be Italy and Portugal and, and Great Britain and France would go and litter our beaches uh, with their um, toxics, uh, the toxins that come with all the, the most powerful weapons. 
And today, you, you're not allowed into much of uh, all those lands. Uh, yes. Did they use depleted uranium weapons there? They used depleted uranium. It was an accident. Yeah. They didn't mean to do it. They dropped 258 uh, uranium, uh, depleted uranium bombs. Um, accidentally, they said. Uh, they didn't discover the accident for 258 of them. Um, and this happened just before they used uh, depleted uranium bombs in Iraq. Literally uh, two months before the first depleted uranium bombs were uh, were were um, used in Iraq, but yes, and, and and I'll show something about the contamination, the consequences, the health consequences of that. These are uh, now uh, piles of uh, debris of of, uh, of ordnance uh, shells. Uh, I had the experience of, of uh, the first time I saw this. Uh, I was scuba diving in. Not in Vieques, but in Culebra. Remember, I mentioned uh, Culebra was uh, used to be bombed um, as much, if not more, than Vieques until uh, well, 1980 or so, when, when the bombing stopped in, in in Culebra, and then Vieques got it much worse. Uh, but I had the experience of being scuba diving and then seeing something on the on the floor of the ocean. It looked like you know the the old milk bottles that shape. And when I got closer, I realized there were shells. Uh, bomb shells, and it freaked me out. I just got the heck out of the area because we do know that there, uh, that the floor of the ocean out there is littered with unexploded ordnance. That, they, that to this day, uh, to this day, they're uh, they're fishermen uh, that happen to drop the anchor in the wrong place and uh, and, and and detonate a bomb. Um, as I mentioned, that happened in Culebra Island to a tourist in this, this most beautiful beach uh, some 30 years after they had stopped bombing, stopped bombing and had actually supposedly cleaned that beach. Um, you use some of these uh, discarded tanks for target practice, uh, discarded planes. Uh, and this is uh, Monte Carmelo. Uh, it became um, Sorry, I, I forget the dates. I think it was 1994 or 95 when um, the Navy accidentally dropped uh, two 500-pound bombs in a, um, a watchtower uh, that was being patrolled by a, uh, a civilian, uh, a cancer civilian by the name David Sanis, uh, who was an employee of the Navy, and uh, his job was to make sure people would not enter. Uh, that zone, uh, but he was firing off, and, and, and uh, he was killed. He was killed here, and uh, and, and so it it, it it really gave the death of David Sales marked a a very uh, dramatic increase in the protest, and it eventually led to the end of the bombing. Uh, there have been protests since the very first day uh, that they announced that they want to expropriate. Uh, uh, Vieques land. Um, our uh, nationalist hero, uh, Bisu Campos, was arrested in Vieques in 1942, uh, protesting the takeover. So this is 60 years of, uh, 60 some years, 62 years of, of bombing, and 62 years of protest, 62 years of arrest of thousands of people uh, in Vieques. And, uh, and that's what it took to eventually end. Uh, I have a few here on the uh, on the degradation, these are uh, there's an amazing uh, uh, ocean uh, uh, ocean uh, ecologist in the University of Georgia, James Porter, that uh, did some very important work in discovering um, all the unexplored ordnance uh, in in and around Vieques, uh, the beaches of Vieques. This is interesting. Uh, I wonder if I have, I may have a better picture of this. One of the things he discovered is that there was this barge, this huge barge, a uh, sunken barge, and it had hundreds of 55 gallon drum uh, uh, drums uh, filled with some, with who knows what. And, uh, and he managed to get, uh, with this is a, uh, a part of what he was doing, uh, was doing a, uh, a study about the degradation of the oceans around Vieques. And uh, so he had Geiger counter, and he noticed that it was radioactive. Um, 
It took us uh, something like, it took the Pentagon finally something like nine years to acknowledge. Uh, I don't remember the name of the of that ship, but this was a ship that was used in one of those um, uh, uh, nuclear tests in the Pacific. This is the Atlantic. Was they used it uh, to, uh, to test the effects of uh, nuclear bombs on the ship. And they had all sorts of uh, measuring equipment to see what, was, what would be the effects. And so this, uh, they, they literally took this uh, ship, they cleaned up some of the area, they put it up in those 55 gallon drums, and they dragged it, who knows why, but they dragged it all the way around Cabo de Hornos and uh, in uh, the tip of South America, all the way to Vieques, and then they sank it there. Um, this is a, uh, an endangered species, uh, a huge uh, leatherback turtle. And, and what we'll see now is that some of the uh, beaches, some of the, uh, the endangered species uh, exist in Vieques. This is the land crab, it's not endangered, it's a threatened species. Uh, but they have been found to have very high concentrations uh, and it's a, it's, it's a problem for us because it's a delicacy, the land crabs, uh, king, cra king crabs you may call them, uh, wages for us. Uh, they, they're found to have high concentrations of arsenic, lead, cadmium, uh, um, uh, and other toxic metals uh, that are, have resulted in, as we'll see, some of the, uh, the highest rates of cancer in Puerto Rico. This is a brown pelican, also an endangered species, uh, a dead brown pelican. Uh, an older uh, leatherback turtle with eggs. They come, as you may know, these are amazing animals uh, uh, that always go back to the same beaches they were born uh, to lay eggs. Uh, and uh, it's the only time they go back to that beach. And so I guess that was the mission of this now the uh, leatherback, tinglar we call them. This is a humpback whale, I believe. Uh, the endangered manatees. Uh, all of these are taken in Vieques. Uh, I forget what these are. There's a dozen species. Maybe there's somebody here. Now. Turns. I think maybe maybe turns. Maybe. Um, so the next the next uh, few slides are about the effects of uh, bombing on Vieques. Um, and again, I'll, I'll try to go quickly through these. Vieques is continues to hurt. Uh, the unemployment of rate of Vieques remains at almost fifty percent. There are really no industry at Vieques. <laughs> Some of the, uh, the wonderful activists that, that, that I met uh, a few weeks ago are trying to have a, a micro-enterprise incubator, trying to do hydroponics, and trying to do other projects. But it's very difficult to, to sustain a business in here, uh, even after the, the, uh, the Navy left. So uh, again, people live off fishing, but fishing is depleted around vehicles. Uh, Culebra has had a much, uh, I, I happen to be a scuba diver, I've done a bit of scuba diving on Vieques and Culebra. You, you scuba dive in Culebra, you see a lot of wild, uh, you see a lot of fish life. You scuba dive about Vieques and it's not had the, uh, as much time as Culebra to go uh, over and you see a lot of dead coral and you see uh, very few fish, you see very few uh, 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 lobsters. Uh, it's much better fishing than Culebra. And I want to get into the um, into the chemicals. And I only had a cheat sheet uh, because I didn't play chemistry in high school. <laughs> one of the uh, the the most uh, dangerous toxins that, that we find in vehicles are heavy metals. And, uh, and, and they are, uh, many scientists believe, the leading cause of why vehicles has a rate of cancer that is roughly one third higher than the rate in Puerto Rico, with no industry. At least in other parts of Puerto Rico, if we were, uh, our government was uh, corrupt enough to take a bribe and put a, uh, a coal firing plant in the most damaging part of Puerto Rico, so the trade winds go from east to west, so they put this coal firing plant in uh, south easternmost Puerto Rico, so the, the coal dust uh, flies all over Puerto Rico. That cannot, doesn't happen in Vieques. There's no explanation in Vieques for why 
Um, there's no industry in Vegas. The Navy would not allow it. Uh, so there's no explanation or no logical explanation why um, why there's such a high rate of cancer in Vegas other than um, hundreds of millions of tons of explosives. Um, I'll, I'll demonstrate this in human term, terms in a minute. I'll spare you this, just trust me that it's 30% higher than Puerto Rico. And this is Milvi Adams. Uh, Milvi uh, died at age two. Uh, she had multiple forms of cancer. Um, and when they tested her hair uh, and her feces and her blood, she had toxic levels of uh, cadmium, antimony, arsenic, mercury, lead, nickel, and uranium. Her father was a fisherman, which probably explains some of her diet. Um, you know, they recommend today you do not eat more than um, something like a pound of uh, Vieques fish a, a, a week, I believe. Uh, and, and the levels of arsenic, the level of, of cadmium in many of these uh, uh, blood and uh, in her system was way beyond what is uh, considered uh, uh, toxic for humans. Uh, but she was not alone. But what Millie B, if David Sanes was an adult that became a symbol, uh, that, that uh, a civilian man that died in that in that uh, uh, that accident, Millie B became a, uh, a rallying cry uh, for many of the people of Vieques. And, and the death of Mili was something that, uh, that made many of us sad. Uh, many of us have never mind. So many of us here uh, were part of that movement. Uh, a wonderful woman over there, uh, uh, the say woman, uh, Carmen Perez Hogan, uh, who was born in Vieques, who was an important uh, who played an important role in the movement here in Albany. Uh, just wait, Carmen, please. She's an amazing woman. Uh, we've done many things for our Latino community. And she, more than anyone, is responsible for why uh, we managed to get the, um, the New York State Assembly and the New York State Senate to uh, approve uh, unanimous resolutions urging an end of the bombing. Uh, it was important because it Um, it was important because something like two, three weeks after the uh, the assembly passed those, uh, after the uh, the assembly passed the second resolution, uh, Pataki became convinced that it was politically expedient to support um, an end of the bombing, and he went to uh, to the White House. And he uh, helped persuade uh, W. Bush to end the bombing. And, the, and but W. Bush announced the end of the bombing uh, just a few weeks after Pataki visited there. So thank you, Carmen. Um, it's a reminder that uh, we in uh, all over the world uh, were an important part of this uh, part that I hope to be able to show you now if Windows would allow me. Um, So one of the things that we did, uh, there were tens of thousands of arrests uh, of people that invaded the, uh, the uh, uh, invaded the, beca the beaches of Vieques, uh, as we had done years earlier in Culebra Island. It was uh, the movement was very instructive to many of us in many ways. It was instructive because. Um, it really became a, a time when uh, when all of Puerto Rico joined in support of uh, of Vieques, of ending the bombing of Vieques. Uh, we often say that if you get four Puerto Ricans together, there'll be five political parties. Uh, we we argue a lot. Politics is our national sport. Um, 
And, uh, and so we have had historically difficulty getting together about our own particular issue. Vieques broke the mold. Um, practically, not practically, every single major de uh, religious denomination in Puerto Rico uh, not only supported an end of the bombing, but had their leaders arrested. The Archbishop of San Juan, uh, the uh, Lutheran Bishop of, uh, of Caguas, uh, there were many uh, leaders of, the, uh, of religious congregations uh, that, were, uh, that were arrested in Vieques. It was also true of many of our best known artists, uh, singers, musicians, uh, 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 ballet dancers, all of our uh, uh, much of our artists uh, were very much a part of that movement as well. And, uh, and so we'll see that there were encampments, uh, people that literally got in the, uh, in the line of fire uh, to stop the bombing. Um, and eventually the, it, it became a, a nightmare for the Pentagon to try to conduct their, uh, their, uh, their, their exercises, their games, they call them. Uh, so people lived there for months, uh, they were arrested and, and all this would take their place. There were, um, I forget now the figure, but there were something like like close to 18,000 people arrested in the Vegas. That double counts some people, uh, but there were about 18,000 arrests in Vegas. As you can see, the, the, each religious congregation uh, formed uh, uh, their tents and there was an ecumenical chapel. Uh, but it was it was it was truly a, uh, a movement of all of Puerto Rico, uh, and that in fact became the emblem. All of Puerto Rico were Vieques. Um, some of the largest demonstrations, the largest demonstrations in our history, uh, happened there. We had uh, Viequenses, uh, uh, Viequense fishermen, uh, getting between those in, in their rickety boats, uh, getting between those huge uh, warships. Uh, risking their lives, and in, in this case, <coughs> literally, it's David against Goliath. The guy has a, uh, what is it that David used? Uh, slingshot. A slingshot. So he's using a slingshot to fight the, the, the U.S. Navy. Um, here's some of the arrests. Um, uh, waiting to be arrested. That's Alan Ch uh, Alan Charter. Whoops. <laughs> Al Sharpton. What is the difference in this Al Sharpton? All the ways he lost, he lost it for during six months in prison. Um, and that's a sh the, the Sharpton that we, uh, that we know. So it was a good diet plan for Al Sharpton for six months in, uh, in prison. Um, some religious leaders, more religious leaders. Um, I don't know who they are. Um, that's uh, Congressman Luis Gutierrez who has, has been in, oh, yeah. The best friend of Puerto Rico and of Vieques in, in the U.S. Congress, unfortunately, he's not running for re-election this time. But he has been a champion for, uh, for Vieques and for Latino causes all over. Uh, she's a uh, president of the Puerto Rican Independence Party, uh, Lourdes uh, Santiago. Um, uh, people were uh, pepper sprayed. Um, and we're going to see some well-known people uh, in a minute. Uh, that's uh, uh, RFK, Robert uh, Kennedy Jr. Um, Jesse Jackson also was arrested to the right of uh, on the boat. The guy in the blue shirt is Dennis uh, Rivera, who was then president of uh, 1199, SEIU, uh, who was a very important, uh, who played a very important role. Uh, that union played a very important role in ending the bombing. Uh, they were very influential. Uh, also getting to uh, persuade the politicians, uh, leading politicians, to help persuade Dolby Bush to finally end the bomb. Uh, Jesse Jackson spent some time in prison, as did uh, Edward James Olmos, as did um, dozens of, of well-known artists. Uh, <coughs> as Congressman Serrano arrested at the White House, uh, she is an amazing woman, no longer with us. Uh, Isabel Rosado, they, at that time, she was 93, an old uh, Nationalist Party leader, uh, also among the arrested in Vieques. The fight also took place in this country. Um, this is a demonstration I believe in Chicago, uh, this one in New York. And these are some wonderful <laughs> knots <laughs> that 
invaded the Statue of Liberty. The, the story of these guys, what we call uh, one of these guys, uh, Tito Cañac, Alberto de Jesus, and, uh, and he's done a lot of these uh, amazing things. Nothing as far out as this, because he was afraid that there were folk set by that actually flying on the Statue of Liberty, but because they didn't want to be discovered, they didn't take any ropes. And they're holding on with their shoelaces, uh, because they didn't want to be discovered. Uh, they managed to unfurl a, a Vieques flag and a, a Puerto Rican flag. Um, there was another time when uh, the Statue of Liberty had, as if you got a headache, she had the, the flag of Puerto Rico in her forehead from another invasion by another group. Uh, but these were important because they, they, they brought the message about what was going on in Vieques. And this is also an opening for Vieques uh, here uh, when uh, Hillary Clinton had come uh, to uh, to Albany, and we uh, we demonstrated it. Uh, we had many of these. This is in uh, a World Series at the time in uh, 2000. Um, uh, several people got arrested there, and this one says, "This fence will not fall by itself. Uh, united, we will achieve a free vehicles. So more pictures, and again, I'll go quickly over these because I want to make time for the questions. Uh, pictures about the devastation of Vieques. Um, many, many people lost their homes, uh, their businesses. Um, uh, nobody lost a, their life in Vieques, although there were, uh, as you have heard, uh, a new, there's a new count being uh, done because uh, nobody lost their life actually during the hurricanes. But um, there was an excess of a thousand more deaths. Uh, during the period of, uh, during the, uh, the month following Maria, uh, in comparison to the previous year. Uh, and those were people who did not have their uh, access to their um, life-saving machines that require electricity, their uh, dialysis, their CPAP machines, their, um, I forget now, all the, all the, all the uh, equipment, all the medical equipment that, that was not available to, uh, to these people. <coughs> Something happened to the computer when you put it off. I can't do display now. Uh, but we're almost close to the end. Uh, again, I'll, I'll go through these um, quickly. We were here, and bananas has been uh, restored. I had a mojito of uh, bananas. So, uh, this, believe it or not, is a scuba dive shop that was located across the street and tumbled <coughs> all the way to the beach in Esperanza. Uh, this is an amazing tree, uh, a 300 year old tree, and I think I can back up. That's a before picture, and this is the after picture of La Gran Ceiba de Vieques. Um, the tree is recovering. This, by the way, is Radio Vieques, and we hope that in a few weeks, um, with the help of people like Carmen and others in the community, uh, we hope uh, to be able to send a group of 12 students from Hudson Valley Community College with three instructors to install solar panels in Radio Vieques. Uh, this is actually not their station, this is actually a transmitting tower uh, for Radio Vieques. Um, Radio Vieques is back on the air. Uh, it's, a, it's a true community radio station. And it's not a low power community. It's a, uh, it's a radio station that serves all of Vieques and Culebra Islands and all of Puerto Rico's uh, eastern seaboard and, and some towns beyond that. Uh, and if it's a true community radio station, uh, it was sweet to see uh, high school kids uh, doing their shows and doing their, uh, their hip hop, uh, their, uh, not hip hop, uh, regatón. Uh, competitions on, on, on Radio Vieques. <clears throat> so we do hope, we, and I'll speak about that in a few minutes, we do hope uh, here in the capital region to help uh, bring solar power to Vieques, and I'll talk about that. Um, <clears throat> it's one of the famous blue tarps. But my first impression of the hurricanes, I'm, I'm, my, the, the, the flight from New York is, is landing, uh, is coming close to San Juan approaching landing, I say, wow, why are there so many, I've never seen so many swimming pools uh, in, uh, in, in San Juan. 
And as the plane came closer, and I realized it wasn't swimming pools, it was this blue tarp that served as a roof for tens of thousands of homes all over Puerto Rico. You see these blue tarps, including, of course, in Vieques. Um, that's the end of the slideshow. Um, is what we are trying to do here in the capital region. And uh, some of you have been in this one. Yeah. And some of you have this about a benefit concert that's happening uh, next Saturday. Uh, and that's part of uh, uh, one of the fundraisers that is going to be help fuel uh, this project to bring uh, solar energy to the uh, It happens, so often happens just by the, uh, luck, perhaps. So some of us began to call around, and of course I called Carmen, and she called Alain, and she called all the people. We, called, we got together to uh, try to put assistance to Vieques. Um, it's hard to compete for which municipality. We have 78 municipalities. Vieques and Culebra are two of them. But it's hard to compete for the title of which was the most devastated municipality. And it's a title nobody wants to win. Um, people say that perhaps Utuado was worse hit than Vieques, but who cares? Vieques was terribly devastated. Um, hundreds of people lost their wounds. And this is a, 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 a very important municipality. Vieques is unique. It's not just that they have that a wonderful carnival in the middle of the summer. It's that they have a sense of of community that few public municipalities in Puerto Rico has. Vieques has a, 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 an organization because they fought against the Navy for so long until they were successful. They organize um, uh, community groups against the, uh, against the bombing in every barrio, in every uh, community in Vieques. And some of those still exist. So that when the hurricanes hit, uh, Vieques was prepared to, to take care of its own. Thank God, because certainly the federal or the Puerto Rican government did very little for Vieques in the first month. Vieques, 100% uh, of Vieques was without ele electricity. Uh, when I was there, only, uh, and I left on January uh, 9th, just a few days ago. Uh, when I left Vieques, only something like six or eight streets had electricity, other than uh, the people that are lucky enough to have uh, gas power generators. So Vieques remains uh, in, in a lot of pain. One of the things that has happened, and this is contradictory, we, we, we had high hopes of a, an equal, uh, the movement to oust the Navy. It wasn't just about ousting the Navy. We called it the, the, the plan of the four Ds. I hope I can remember now that the four Ds are, because my brain is not working too well. But it was about the uh, demilitarization. It was about the devolution of lands. Uh, it was about the uh, decontamination and the development, the uh, ecologically sound development of Vieques. And there's been a lot of consciousness raising about protecting the Vieques environment. And we saw some, uh, some high school kids planting those uh, red mangroves. And, and this is going on all over Vieques. But the other thing that's happened in Vieques, sadly, is gentrification. Once we ousted the Navy, there were many wealthy people from the United States and from Puerto Rico that have now built uh, million dollar homes in Vieques. And you can see them up in a hill. I couldn't see them. This is a gay community. Uh, Governor Pataki has a house there now. Uh, Joe Bruno has a house there now. Uh, you know where Joe Bruno got his money. Um, so this is what's happening. And because there's been that gentrification, some of the young people of Vieques cannot make a living in Vieques. Because there's so much unemployment in Vieques, and, and the land speculation has raised the price of the land of Vieques. It's a small island. It, and it's not only a small island. They still don't allow us access to two-thirds of the island because it's too contaminated, because it has too much unexploded ordnance. So all of Vieques is still concentrated on that third strip of the island. 
And so the land prices have skyrocketed, and many young people in Vieques cannot live in Vieques. Um, and so part of what we're doing is we're trying to bring, uh, we're trying to bring uh, um, some help to Vieques that may also help the development of Vieques. And you had a comment, a question? Yeah. Does the federal government have a plan yet to clean up that property? I mean, that's going to cost billions of dollars. Well, they have a plan, all right. Um, they've been doing, they've been carrying out the plan. They take the unexploded or ordinance and they explode it, which means that all the concentration of arsenic, lead, cadmium, uranium um, is blown up in the air and because it's on the eastern end of the island, the trade winds go from east to west, they blow the contaminated toxins all over the island. That is their plan. And they continue to carry it on. Joe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One question and a little statement. The question is, you mentioned that although Cuba was also hit by these two hurricanes, and they were at hurricane level five, I believe, when they hit Cuba. It was. You, you mentioned that in a very short period of time, they got all their electricity back, and uh, they don't have the devastation anymore um, that they had. What is the difference that made it so that Cuba could do that and Puerto Rico, which is part of the richest country in the world, the United States, supposedly, although I believe it's just a colony, and most people do, but that's the way we've stated it, they couldn't do it. That's the one question. The other thing is, I just wanted to say that- Joe, don't push me. I have another PowerPoint on that. Okay. <laughs> we were, I don't want a PowerPoint, but I like a, 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 we have a, a donation can, and we were thinking, that it might, maybe we can in the room here pass it around and give generously to help with the students that were going down and the um, electrification project that you mentioned down there. If that's appropriate, we'd like to pass that around and do yeah. that. The United Nations, UNESCO, has uh, identified Cuba as one of the leaders in disaster preparedness around the world. In fact, several states um, <coughs> Um, in the United States have studied disaster preparedness in Cuba, disaster recovery in Cuba. Uh, I have a PowerPoint that I did not present, I will not inflict on you, um, that was done by the New Jersey uh, Disaster Preparedness Commission after Hurricane Sandy. They went to study different parts of the world and, and their, the commission particularly identified all the lessons that they could learn from Cuba. Lessons that go from uh, the meteorological service that is world class that provides um, announcements about hurricane threats way before uh, the US Meteorological Service does. Um, they don't do what the Meteorological Service in Cuba does not do those cones where uh, the hurricane is expected to, uh, uh, to go because those can be very misleading as has happened in Florida uh, a few years ago, a hurricane that that hit a, a part of, of, of Florida that was not expected and caused much devastation. So they, they prepare they prepare much of the island uh, for a hurricane. They know hurricanes. Um, but they also do things like they, they help evacuate people before the hurricanes. They don't just go after the hurricane to help recover people. And, and they help uh, uh, recover um, uh, high school kids will go to get bananas and all of the trees, to get fruits of the trees, because they know that many of those trees will not survive. So at least they'll have something. I could not get tostones in Puerto Rico now, uh, four, three months after uh, this planting, fried plantings, uh, because we have no plantain, plantains in Puerto Rico. And yet, in, in, uh, before the hurricanes in Cuba, they, they, uh, they took, uh, they harvested, uh, the fruits before they were ready, but at least they had something that, uh, that survived the hurricane. They, they protect our cattle, um, or um, they even have warehouses where uh, you can load your, some of your furniture um, if you're in certain parts of Cuba. Uh, and so they mobilize way ahead of time. A lot of what, what we do here and a lot of what's happening in Puerto Rico is to go after the fact. But Cuba, again, is disaster preparedness. Who knew uh, that, disaster, that these type of disasters happen in the Caribbean? Uh, well, these days they happen in New Jersey and New York also. Um, so Cuba does something, uh, does also a few other things after the fact. Um, so in Puerto Rico, we had the uh, National Guard activated 
And the National Guard were bayonet in hand uh, to keep the Puerto Ricans from getting out of hand. In Cuba, the army was all over the island uh, clearing debris, which the National Guard in Puerto Rico did not do at all. They had uh, units of uh, engineers uh, in, the, uh, in the Cuban military beginning to set up. They have already placed uh, electrical wires in the, in the areas that, where they may need it. Uh, and they begin right after that. The, the, uh, the Cuban army has divisions that are engineers that will do that. Cuba has uh, a problem sometimes of being hyper-educated. Uh, and it is a problem. I'm not being silly about that. Uh, but it is a times like that when, they're high, when the, uh, the high level of education in Cuba, as in the, the case of, of having many engineers, uh, will make a difference. There are many, many other things. Again, I have a PowerPoint here, so don't challenge me. Don't uh, push me on that. Um, yeah, um, I could. Can we pass this? Please. Number one. Number two, um, uh, what Tom was mentioning about that, I have a study of decontamination. How, did, how would the hurricane have impacted the contamination of, like, Puerto Rico or from other areas because of all of this stuff that's on there. I mean, has anybody done any studies of the churning of the sea? The no studies yet. Just a lot of worry. Uh, in the that I heard a lot about that. And particularly, if you lost your roof, all that toxins are falling into all your all of your house. You're sleeping with that dirt, with that toxic dirt. Um, it, it's coming through. Uh, uh, some of you may know he, he was here, Robert Rabin. Uh, an amazing man in Vieques, one of the uh, MVPs of the Vieques struggle. Uh, he lost all the windows in his home. Um, and, uh, and so with no windows, with no roof, uh, we, there have been no studies. But yes, you can guess that the trade winds brought, uh, that the hurricane winds uh, from, flowing from east to west that blew that over the um, for the, uh, the post-data part of the I, I also want to thank you for using names of people. When you mentioned the woman in the, you know, in the, in the shack, and you mentioned you named these people, and I think that's really critical for all of us to do this, to bring up, to continue the humanity. Well, there you go. Sure. So, I'm not good at names, but <laughs> thank you. Maggie. Uh, well, I, um, Pepe said that Puerto Rico and Cuba are two wings of the same bird, and they are. But in one wing, they had a revolution in 1959, and the values really are changed because the working people are in power. And I was one of the people, Ray Parsons and I were on the brigade in October. Two weeks after the hurricane, we were like, where's the damage? And then we went to the eastern part of the island for the day, you know, it was the anniversary of the fall of Che in combat. And we, we saw the places most hit. And in the, in the southern, in the forest, the trees were pretty bad. But in the towns, it was all recovered. And it was just what Pepe said. It's exactly the opposite of Puerto Rico. The trees are right. recovered, the towns have not. But yes, exactly. And everyone had electricity. And then they explained to us, the university shut down. The students went out and helped evacuate. They don't just evacuate the people. They evacuate the cats and dogs. They evacuate the cattle. And then they bring it back. The electricians were already in place with the equipment. But also, everyone told us, it's the whole, it's like they're prepared for an invasion. Everyone knows what they're going to do. They're prepared for hurricanes. Everyone knows what to do. And the people with better, sturdier houses had the people with, you know, houses more vulnerable come stay with them. And it was, it, it's, the, it's a society of human solidarity. But there will be a revolution in Puerto Rico, like there will be in the United States. And... We have a book back here, by a speech by Rafael Pinsel Miranda, who is one of the uh, nationalist heroes, who says it's called um, Independence is a Necessity. But you really do see the, the uh, colonialism, the real bare, naked truth of the colonial relations. And I wanted to ask you to just explain briefly the backdrop of all this. Uh, Pro Mesa, the famous promise law, and the, what the La Junta is. Um, what's happening every day to Puerto Rico economically? You know, Maggie, that's really another story. A whole other presentation. Uh, but what Puerto Rico is really hurting, as we've all heard, uh, after the hurricanes, 
half a million Puerto Ricans have left our yes. island. Uh, half a, this is a, a, a country of 3.2 million people. Half a million have left. Many of them will never come back. Uh, but the migration did not start then. Uh, the migration started in right after the Second War, because uh, under U.S. colonialism, the priorities were not about our development, uh, and and so that many of our people have had to leave. Many of us. Uh, there are now more Puerto Ricans, and even before the hurricanes, there were more Puerto Ricans in the United States than there were Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico, because so many of us have had to leave because we cannot make uh, a living there, or sometimes because the uh, political repression is too much. Uh, uh, but just to mention uh, one of the connections between Cuba and Puerto Rico and the level of complicity of the Puerto Rican government in, in enabling the use of, of the military use of Culebra and Vieques. 1961, uh, Bay of Pigs happened, and it was a terrible defeat for the United States, as you know. Right after the, the, uh, the defeat at Bay of Pigs, um, the Pentagon decided that they needed to prepare better, that, Q, the, uh, that they were not likely to, that Cuba was not as easily taught as they thought it would be. And they <coughs> developed a plan known now as vampire, the Vampire Plan, uh, that we only come, came to know about it in 2012, when a scholar at the University of Puerto Rico obtained some documents from the Pentagon, uh, and then later from the JFK Library, library about this plan. The plan was to get all the Puerto Ricans out of Vieques and Culebra Islands and, and devote those two islands that are across from Roosevelt Road that used to be, now it's closed, it used to be the largest naval base in the Atlantic. Um, and they wanted to use these two islands for more military exercises, for more invasions, to prepare for another invasion of Cuba. They called the plan uh, the Vampire Plan because they didn't just want to get all the Puerto Ricans living in Culebra and all the Puerto Ricans living in Vieques. They wanted to honor the rest of, of, of the, the buried Puerto Ricans, Viequenses, in the cemetery so that the people would not have a reason to go back. Um, and, and the name, uh, plan, uh, plan Vampiro, actually came from the then governor, Luis Muñoz Marin, who supported the vampire plan, even though he knew what it was, and he called it, he labeled it, plan, the vampire plan, uh, he was negotiating with JFK to give all of Culebra and all of Vieques to the Pentagon. Um, so there's been this complicity that, that, that has kept Vieques from being, uh, uh, from, from having industries, from having, uh, uh, from allowing Vieques to make a living. Uh, people today speak of the Hawaiization of Vieques, and perhaps in a few years we'll be talking about the Hawaiization of Puerto Rico. And so many Puerto Ricans live, and you see the wealthy people build these amazing homes. Uh, in a place like that, it could become. We do hope, and, and again, Vieques <coughs> is an amazing place. It's well organized. They're, they remain, uh, uh, they, they still have community organizations in, in every neighborhood of Vieques. And, and so they're organizing, and they see this plan to bring solar power. We didn't come up with it. We just happened to be working on it at the same time as other people were. But we do have an opportunity now to build a uh, solar power at the, this is the historical museum called Fortin uh, Conde de Mirasol, the fort of, uh, of Miros, Count of Mirasol Fort, uh, that houses Radio Vieques, a radio station, and a museum, uh, an important archaeological museum that has, uh, I'll tell you about the museum some other time. Um, but what we, we're, we're going to, in, in, in just a few weeks, there will be some students uh, uh, with some instructors installing the computer, the, the, the theoretical <coughs> part of the photovoltaic program at Hudson Valley. And they're going to be there for up to a month, uh, providing, developing the solar panels with battery backup uh, for this. Uh, but more than that, if, if this plan succeeds, uh, Hudson Valley tells us that they will be graduating a new class every 15 weeks. And every 15 weeks, they, they need a project. The students need a practical project, and they would love to go to Vieques. And the people of Vieques, when, when I met with them about a couple of weeks ago, uh, 10 days ago, uh, they already have an idea of what, what will be next. Uh, so the students are going to stay at this uh, Methodist Cemetery, 
Seminary. No me parecía. En Esperanza, the second uh, town in Vieques. Um, and uh, the house is up to 30 people. And they're going to get the second uh, solar, uh, solar system, solar array for that. And it's already, uh, they're already developing um, plans to solarize all of Vieques. The plan is to solarize all of Vieques because they see an opportunity here that comes out of the devastation of Maria to, uh, sometimes I get emotional about these things, um, an opportunity to, to, to make Vieques a green island of the Caribbean. It still has all those terrible toxins. It's still an amazingly beautiful place. There's still supposedly a commitment from, uh, it's now a, uh, a super fun site. The priorities, uh, the highest priority super fund size, supposedly. They're going about it through the, wor the worst way. Uh, but they're supposed to decontaminate that. Uh, and they're supposed to eventually give us back some of that land. Um, and the idea is that Vieques can, um, can develop itself as a, as a site for small scale ecotourism uh, that on an island that all of the electricity will be generated in that island in sustainable ways. They also have some projects for wind, uh, for wind power, and they've had, uh, Elon Musk was in Vieques just recently, and Elon Musk uh, people were there just last, this Thursday, they went back to Puerto Rico because they have already, Elon Musk has in Tesla and Solar City, I believe. Um, he, he actually has done quite a bit uh, for Vieques, they donated, a, their own loan, uh, solar array that is powering, providing 80% of the uh, of the energy for the current hospital. It's really a clinic uh, in Vieques. Uh, for some more severe um, uh, conditions, you have to be uh, to go on an airlift ambulance or to go on a ferry that takes way too long when it runs um, to Puerto Rico's main island. But in any case, it's providing 80% of the uh, electricity for that, uh, that hospital. <coughs> 100% uh, of the electricity for the water pumps of Vieques, 100% of the electricity for the water treatment plants of Vieques. So Elon Musk has been, he's, of course, he, he's also a businessman, I think he's probably also a good guy, philanthropist, philanthropist that uh, sees an opportunity to show that particularly these Caribbean islands uh, near, the, the, uh, near the equator that get so much solar energy that they could, that they are a good, um, model for developing uh, solar energy. So um, so there's an interest in, in the project that we've, that will be joined, uh, we didn't initiate it. Um, ours will be the third, the fourth project, uh, the fourth, fourth solar project in Vieques. Um, but again, they, they're, they're not alone. They, they, Vieques people are resourceful. There's still all those people that you saw marching, and still many of them are still supporting Vieques. Vieques is a special place. That was the message I wanted to get to you uh, today. Uh, it really deserves our support. Um, any other questions? Carmen. I don't have a question. I just would like to thank you yes. for recognizing me as an honor. It's a, a special honor to be recognized by a man who has Vieques in his heart, in his soul, in his force. I am just so proud of the work that he has done. And I am so grateful as someone who was born in Vieques I am so grateful to him, his family, and all of the, he, he just has used all of his personal resources, his family connections, his family's connection to help me, I guess. And from the beginning, from the first time that I met you when we started talking about me, I guess, I love you, I appreciate you. Please, let's show him what a tremendous <laughs> I was thinking that uh, you know, basically we have a system, mm -hmm. North American system of exploitation, opportunity, shock doctrine. This has devastated so many homes. These people probably don't have insurance on them. They don't know what they can do. They probably do they own something? It's like we have deeds. I don't know if they have deeds or they just live there. But I would imagine people here have lots of money can go and say, okay, we'll give you much more than you're ever going to see. 
sell me your place and I'll build a mansion. Is that probably going on? It's not a problem in Vieques because the resettling of people in Vieques happened so recently that, and, and they were so concentrated that they really got a deed to their little piece of land. They do. It's pretty crowded. But it happens in, in the rest of Puerto Rico. I, I read somewhere that something like nearly 40% of the uh, of the claims that have been filed with FEMA um, uh, will not be um, people cannot produce deeds uh, to their homes. Uh, they are what we call our demand, people that just you allow me to live but live on your land, even though my family may have lived here for a hundred years, we don't own this land, and that is true of many many parts of Puerto Rico, uh, primarily those people that lost everything as Doña Andrea so would have. How's the water? Um, this summer of the year, the water supply in Vegas is good. Um, in the summer, uh, Vegas gets crowded, and, uh, and some of the wells dry up, and then the water becomes uh, has this saltier taste. Uh, and so they bring uh, water from uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, but this time of the year, the water is fine, except, except that some of the groundwater is being tested and has high levels of toxins. Uh, 60 years of plumbing. Uh, but the wells that supply the water to the people of Vieques have been tested, and they are, um, it's still, um, we're told. Uh, healthy, not drinking water. Is there any other, I mean, you, you, you obviously had some testing of the water, but you mentioned all this other air site contamination with the trade winds. Is there any testing that's actively going on now for that? Um, the uh, Center for Disease Control uh, dragged their feet about conducting some of the uh, early studies. Uh, and then some Puerto Rican uh, University of Puerto Rico and Inter-American University of Puerto Rico scientists uh, went and did some of the studies. The study of, uh, for instance, Milly V, that little girl, um, uh, along with, with Milly V, there were uh, a couple thousand people had their hair tested, and they found that something like 30% of the population had, um, had uh, significant levels of, um, of some of those toxic metals. Uh, we see that on the land crabs, we see that on, on some of the, the, uh, the crops that grow in parts of the Ecos. Uh So there's, uh, there's an ongoing now, uh, they said that the CDC dragged their feet. Uh, um, they have since conducted some studies. And the first studies, they, their studies didn't quite square off with those. Uh, but the more recent studies by Center for Disease Control have found that indeed the Ecos has a uh, more than statistically, it's not more than statistically, a highly statistically significant level of cancer that is uh, that's significantly higher than that of Puerto Rico. Is any of that being discussed as being a super fun site for them? It, it is, it's been uh, identified as a super fun site. Supposedly it's on the highest level of, of priority, which doesn't say much no. because they're really not doing much. Yeah. Uh, and that is the highest priority of Superfund site. Um, that is. I mean, the bigger the site, the harder it is to get them to do something. We've got nuclear weapon sites in the United States, like at Hanford and Savannah River, that they really can't clean up. And the level of contamination is probably higher than on the Yankees. But with the, when, the, when the Superfund site is 10 miles long like that, and there's 60 years of ordinance there, they just, they literally don't know what to do because they're, they're afraid to even do reports to predict what the cost would be trying to remediate it correctly. They have done some remediation on land um, in, in, many ter some, in many terrible ways, in other, but also in helpful ways. What they have done nothing at all is, is with the subaquatic, the, 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 the water around the Ecos, the sea around the Ecos, particularly on the eastern end, they have done nothing about removal of toxins from that region, nothing about removal of unexploded ordnance, and, and that continues to be a threat. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.